So hi, everybody. Welcome to the science working group meeting. Um, lightly attended today. We may see people next week <laughs> or the week after that. Not sure. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Um, so welcome back. What was the Slack reminder? I just said that the meeting was starting soon and here's a link. Oh. Okay, okay. No, yeah. no, that that's something oh. different. We oh. um because this the Slack used to be connected to another Slack and so there are a bunch of people in that channel and then we disconnected it and now we just have like a working group science Slack and it has almost nobody in it, so we think that nobody knows about it. So I think we probably need to add that reminder next week when we have more of the folks on because I just don't think that people are in the channel. Oh, yeah, there's, we, eight, there's eight. Yeah, yeah I think mean, that was that was the, the discussion that we had right before the holidays. Okay. <laughs> like, I'm happy to go back and look at the previous agendas and try to find those folks and add them back in, if if that would be helpful. Yeah, maybe we could just reach out directly on Slack. Well, because I think you can invite people to the channel without... Yeah them so yeah. that they get to either accept or decline it and that might be a good idea to do that with the people that were participating before okay yep got it elizabeth maybe you and i can just make a list here okay, okay. um okay so i going through this so we have these things that we have created, um, which are setting out a set of goals, kind of following the goal question metric approach for scientific software communities. And in a different meeting, um, kind of brought this up with respect to university. And I think I'd like to bring it up here again as well. So we can continue this conversation. And Elizabeth, I saw you put something in the Slack or you sent me a message as well, just kind of about your thoughts on university. So what I was thinking is that as we have people join this conversation or participate in this conversation, um, but the questions that we had prior, these are still the same questions, just phrased a little bit differently, that the questions that we had prior were a little bit too much or too complex. Um, and that we could start phrasing the questions about how and if organizations or different communities are thinking about particular things that would give us an opportunity to focus on the metrics and metrics models that might be relevant in their case. So what I did was I went through this, this slide deck and just kind of reworked the questions around, are you presently considering, for example, are you presently considering how to give credit to a diverse set of contributors or contributions? Or are you presently considering your internal documentation on community processes? For a while, I was <laughs> the top, this was, um, do you care about? how to give credit to a diverse set or do you care about internal? And the answer was yes to everything. And I'm like, <laughs> like you couldn't really answer no to any of the questions sensibly. So I rephrased it a little bit. Like, is this an immediate concern for you and your communities? You know, so like we could almost like, as an example, Elizabeth, like I was, when I was writing these, like we could ask questions like of the chaos project very specific like this and science is a little bit different than university so like is in the chaos project are we currently considering the number of contributions increasing from new people as an example and if we are how are we or how would we go about measuring that so then it gets us to a little bit closer to what that dependent variable is here um which might allow us to start creating models that would help people so sometimes I hate to keep coming back to this concept of the dependent variable, but like sometimes I'm not sure we know what we're measuring. <laughs> like we're measuring the height of a ladder <laughs> when it when it's not, I'm not even using a ladder. <laughs> like it's not the right thing that we're trying to get people to measure because they're not even caring about PRs, for example. 
Um, but yet we, but sometimes we kept pushing on PRs. So I don't know what your what your thoughts are on on this approach. Skip the university talk for a little while, but how we would how we would ask folks that care about um, the communities that they care about in the scientific sense and their focus. Sorry, their focus is a, seems to be a little bit more on communities themselves, like the communities they run or the communities they care about. Sometimes universities seem like it was a little bit more connected with like university strategic goals, like curriculum development. Those are very different things than just focusing on community. So I had a, I felt like I had a little bit more luck doing this route. So what are your thoughts on this? I, I have a question. Yeah, um, sure, or question. In your experience or in your opinion, are the communities in scientific open source evolved or is this something that's pretty new in general to this this context i think a lot of them are pretty old okay so this will be less about helping newcomers get started and more about established communities figuring out kind of how to now now that they've been running for a while how to figure out what what to measure and what to what to do with this stuff and the more long term trends would that be accurate? Um, well at least based on the folks that we've talked with i feel like they're coming from more established community engagements okay so hi i'm dana i'm from the hdf group i'm with the course of people I'll okay run and be social let's see my messy office maybe there you go yeah oh good it's fucked up um so uh <laughs> Yeah, so for us, so, so so we've been around since you know, HDF5 since 1997, and originally was part of we were part of the NCSA, and now we're an individual company. And for us, one of the big things is, I mean, the, first of all, the size of the project, which makes it difficult for people to get in, but also uh, transitioning from kind of yeah, it's open source, but it was walled garden development to to true more to true like a true community. Right, where you, you know, like when you have like the Linux kernel or something like that, you have a lot of disparate experts that are like from different companies and from things like that. And the thing that we've struggled with is that most of our expertise comes from either people who are in the existing company now or are people who worked for us, departed, and still have some connection to like HDF5. And so, so that becomes challenging. And, it, and also, just we have older products, we have like HDF4, which kind of stopped development around the same time HDF5 did 25 years ago. And how do we maintain a community for that, right? We have this legacy software that that's critical. I mean, there's like terabytes of climate data out there that we don't want to go away. But I mean, who, who's gonna work on that that code, right? It's, it's very difficult to, to to kind of keep that. Community. And we've tried, we've, we do more outreach now. We have like more meetings, but it's, uh, it's just this, it's a big challenge, but there's this huge energy barrier to like kind of getting in to the community. It's it's not like a small thing where somebody just show up and just kind of hack around, right? You have to wrap your head around the 300,000 line C application. So but we, we have a lot of challenges with that, with just kind of like the transition from the walled garden thing. Mm -hmm. so and I think one, one of the things that makes the scientific software space um, so challenging when it comes to like goal setting, um, things like this is that we have we have both extremes, right? So we have what Dana just described, which are these big, established, complex projects. And then on the the long, then you have this long tail of just like very, very small projects that were originally written by a single researcher. like the the R community, for example, is sort of notorious for this, where it's it's one person who, for you know, for their own research, spun up a thing, and now it's used by a whole bunch of other people, and still maintained by that one person, and there's no, no real community around it. So I think I think one of the challenges is that we have we have kind of those those both those both of those extremes, and I know it's it's something that when you you know when you talk to when you talk to some of these folks, there are also a lot of people really concerned about those single maintainer projects that are that are used by loads of people. I don't know, Dana, does that resonate with you? I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's hard. Yep. 
I think that that person in Nebraska is Matt because that's where Matt's from. Uh, that's exactly. I, I, I can't hold it up. I can't. I try, but I can't. <laughs> I mean, like, for example, for us, there's H5Pi, which is the glue between Python and HDF5. And that currently has, it's got three maintainers, one of whom is leaving his contract to go to some completely different thing. And th this year, like in the fall, another is a graduate student. And of course, that person's going to evaporate in like a year or two. And then another is like some, some guy who contributes eh, occasionally from Brookhaven. And mm -hmm. so... You know, when when this this guy, Thomas Clover, leaves his job and to go to his next job in in like September, you know, who maintains this this thing that's it's it's the gateway drug for Python people to use HDF five. And so so it's gonna be us basically. Yeah. But yeah, and the other thing is, is is of course finding funding for stuff. That's always like the, the big challenging is, is that if you have a big big project, is how do you how do you find maintenance money and there's like stuff out there but it's really challenging just to just support the day-to-day -day existence of, of a lot of this software a lot of these 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 grants that people have these foundation grants they come with really low overhead you can't run a company with it they only allow like 15 percent overhead so you can't they, you, you're almost losing money doing the work because of your your own internal company so that's also kind of a a challenge is that once once something gets bigger than a couple of graduate students can think about it and work on it in their spare time, it becomes a very difficult job just funding the development for it. Unless some company with a with a actual like you know line of of, of income decides to support it. Coming from this conversation, so thanks, Dana. This is super helpful. Like there are a couple things that being sort of familiar with this slide deck that I think I'm hearing you talk about, mm -hmm. which is the ability to recruit people mm -hmm. for the required project with the expertise level that's necessary. That seemed to be something you were talking about. Yeah, especially if you work in languages that are not fashionable, right? Like there's still a lot of numerical code that's written in Fortran. Where are you going to find a Fortran programmer, right? Those are not there's not just not a lot of them but you know some of our infrastructure uses fortran and so that that's an important thing or even like c right like there's not a lot of people working in c if you've got a python project yeah you can find a lot of people to work on that but as soon as you start using odds and ends like cython like people are less interested in contributing because that's stuff that they don't really understand they can't just dive in they have to like read a book or something so it's, it's harder <laughs> Um, so this is a, a goal around, this is software maintenance specifically mm -hmm. tied to funding. I don't think anything here is necessarily what you precisely talked about, which is, so this is like, maybe the closest, if there's a clear understanding how to spend project funds, but yours was more along the lines of, um, uh, like getting funding how, yeah. how is development funded all right that's, funding. that's a big that's a big problem and then don you had mentioned kind of the um and and also dana you had as well like the dependencies or <laughs> the small projects that exist in my supply chain that may vanish. I don't know if we really address that anywhere in here, to be honest with you. And I think that also has, there's, I think there's two sides to that as well. Like one is, is the dependencies, which you, which you mentioned, but I think also it's some of those, you know, individual people might want other people to contribute and just really don't know how, haven't put any, haven't put any time into it. Um, I think in other cases, they probably don't actually want anyone else to to contribute. And I'm not sure how you how you tease that apart. Um, it's kind of like the corporate open source thing, right? Like I I know um open source projects that are run by companies where they really don't want outside contributors, but it's open source for sort of other marketing reasons. Yeah.
tried to capture that I was also typing while you were talking, Don. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I heard you say there are some communities that they don't they don't want your help. <laughs> like they just want to be the way they are. Yeah, I mean, in, in particular, I keep going back to like the R packages thing because that's that's just kind of the example that people people talk about. But they're they're individual researchers who have put some of their their you know they they've got some new new statistical model and they've written an R package around it, and um, they don't they don't necessarily want other people to contribute to it, but it's open source so that people can that's see it. For, yeah. for research reasons so it's open source for research reasons but not for necessarily community community yeah. reasons gotcha yeah. the uh, open source and licensing only kind of yeah. thing and then that's probably not a goal like i don't know that we need to add this here <laughs> no, i think it's no no no, no. <laughs> the goal is, is to something to keep, i think we need to keep in mind that there, are, there keep are people out <laughs> there are some of those out there yeah i'd say in terms of funding as well one of the things that we've been seeing from the DOE is that there's a lot of magical thinking that, you know, they want all the software to be free. And so they hope that like, oh, we're just gonna make this a community model. And then there's this, if we build it, they will come mentality. And so they have this critical infrastructure and they're just, they're hoping that this critical mass of people show up and donate their time and energy to maintain these complicated software products especially and it gets really silly when you consider that a lot of these things are like for supercomputers and it's like I don't, most people probably don't have a supercomputer so there's kind of the audience of people who can even contribute is yeah that's a, it's a very small number of people yeah, I so and I, I feel like this is changing that we do see more sustainability stuff out there we see more from people where they're talking to us because they have to they've been forced by by management, by the government, whatever, to analyze their supply chains and figure out like, you know, which which packages are you actually dependent on and are these things stable and secure and all that other stuff. And so we, we are seeing more of that, but I feel like the interest is weeding the funding by a lot large amount. What I think is interesting too is I feel like, so I've been a community manager for a really long time and back in the day that it was a hard sell like community management was a hard sell in companies because the roi isn't quite it's like a dotted line right like it's not a very it's not like you know product or whatever so but eventually the the i think that the that corporations have realized that yeah it does take work to build a community and to maintain it and to manage it and to build it and so i feel like that's slowly trickling down into other areas um, universities, scientists, like what exactly what you're talking about is like, it's not exactly magic, right? <laughs> it does take effort and it does take a team, if not one person, a team to manage all of that and to really make effort into building those communities out. So um, that's super interesting to hear. Also, at a certain point, you have to pay developers. Like you can't, like there's, there's only so much right. volunteer work out there, especially for big, complicated projects. And especially when they require, I mean, this is scientific software. So you can't just have arbitrary people. It's not like a, a web thing that like, you know, plugs into some phone app or something like that. I mean, there's lots of, there's a huge audience for that. For scientific software, I you mean, know, these communities are very small. And there are people who are computationally aware and can write quality software. I mean, it's vanishingly small, so. And their time is extremely precious and yeah. They right, often it's graduate them. students, yeah. right? They're, they've got their own stuff going on and, and they're gonna evaporate a lot of people because of you know just the nature of academia they they disappear at a rate of you know they, you get like two or three years out of them and then poof, they're gone we even see that here at chaos you yeah. know we have a, a pretty transient community because we have a lot of students who come and go so yeah we have that same problem here how long has chaos, how long has chaos been around seven years seven years yeah. But the the software that was contributed to the chaos project itself has been around for more like 16 or 17 years. Mm. So quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and to your point, yeah, community is one of the hardest things we do <laughs> and spend a lot of time on. <laughs> lots and lots of time on. Um, and it's a lot easier for us, right? To like to write a metrics definition is way easier than to your point, Dana, of, you know, like writing something that's gonna run on a supercomputer somewhere. It's, it's, mm -hmm. a, 
it's a different it's a different level for sure. So I think it's a bit easier for us to build community. Um, so uh, so kind of coming back to this um, model, I had something else to say, but I forgot. But coming back to this model, um, if if we were to kind of go back to this point, Dana, of uh, the ability to recruit. So everything you're seeing here has come from prior conversations from folks who work on scientific software. So everything you're seeing is a <laughs> these are these are things that people are are thinking about as well. This doesn't just come from the chaos project. You know what I mean? Just like folks here. Um, so if if we were to think about that, um, the hope in the chaos project is that we could provide ways of measuring improvements in your ability to recruit or upskill people to the to the necessary project expertise. Not necessarily telling you how to do it, but trying to understand if the things that you're trying to do are having a positive impact. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we were, this is just purely as an example, kind of based on rewriting this, if, if we were to think about what you might look at, do you have thoughts on how you might go about determining if the outreach efforts that you're taking part in or the mentorship programs that you're taking part in are having a positive impact in the communities that you care about? For us, what we look at is typically is, uh, well, a couple of things. I mean, it's, we have in our community, we have the, um, uh, we have these annual uh, music group meetings um, so there's participation and interest in that, but that's often more about larger community and less direct code contributions. And when it comes to direct code contributions, we look at GitHub activity. And so are people creating pull requests and, and things like that? And so far, I mean, we, we only went to GitHub. We were in Bitbucket before, but it was a private internal Bitbucket thing. So it was very difficult people to contribute code to us. And now that we've been on GitHub for about I think like three or four years. Um, we've seen a lot more, but the there there's when you're looking at those metrics for like GitHub activity, there's a big difference between people contributing to kind of peripheral stuff like documentation, a lot of build system stuff, um, versus like actual internal things. And we get people who do stuff like you know they they try to contribute warning fixes things that can be made kind of locally, but the the big challenge I think for a lot of projects is how do you get people who have a deep interest in your software and can like participate in things like architectural discussions and and things like that. And so far for us, we have had zero people come on in in twenty five years of existence. We've never had a person come into the project that like was not an employee of the company who made major contributions to it. It was not a former employee or something like that. So, so that's really challenging. I mean, part of that is on us, right? I mean, we did not have great internal documentation, which is not unusual for a lot of scientific software. Um, and we tried to improve that. So it may change in the next year, but um, it, so it's not, it, there's not just easy to get metrics where you can just look at, you know, GitHub and see like which people are from external places and which ones are internal. It's, it's, there's kind of like a subjective bit to it too. That's a little harder to interpret, but anybody who's managing a project would know kind of intuitively, like, you know, what are people contributing? You can even look at source files, like for us, for a big project that has a lot of stuff going out there. Well, eh, maybe not, I guess, cause we get a lot of warning fixes or did for a while. And so now there's no warnings left. But those types of internal stuff, but I'm curious, Don, in, in your experience, does that kind of resonate from the corporate side when you're trying to find people to contribute to things, say like Kubernetes, you know, like complex projects? Yeah, for sure. It's something um, so with my CNCF hat on, um, it's something that we see a lot, especially with um Projects like like etcd, for example, which is a key value store. So it's effectively a database um, and it's it's really fairly complex to contribute to. And so 
the people that tend to contribute to it are the people who are paid to contribute to it. And we had an issue where one of the companies was employing a couple of maintainers decided they didn't want to work on it anymore. And so they put their maintainers on, on something, something else. And Etsy did really didn't have enough maintainers for a while. And we've kind of, we've gotten over that with this particular project, but you know, within the CNCF, a lot of the projects that are, are contributed by companies, right? So VM, when I worked at VMware, we contributed a number of projects to the CNCF. And it's really hard to build that contributor base outside of your company. And it's one of the requirements to get to, you know, to move up within the CNCF is that you have to have contributors and maintainers from, from other companies that weren't part of the founding company. And that's probably, you know, with my... Uh, technical advisory group hat on for contributor strategy, that's probably the most common question that we get is, is how to do that. So yes, yes, that resonates with me. And that was a long-winded answer to that. Sorry. <laughs> it's also hard when things are good enough, right? Like it's good enough, it meets our needs. And you know, if there's little itches to scratch, people go in there and fix stuff, add an API call or, you know, tweak some stuff. But in terms of like major architectural changes, like like I mean, that's that's a lot right out of somebody's life and especially if you're really just a newcomer to the the organization to the, to the software like are people going to listen to you and you know are you just are, are you just shouting into the wind so it's it's hard to to get people who are going to come in i mean like for us right hdf5 is like basically our cornerstone application it's the thing that kind of drives everything else we do and so we don't take changes that lightly so people can't just come in and just be like, oh, I have these ideas. We're going to completely redo all this like stuff because they may break a lot of things. And then we have a lot of angry customers. So, you know, it's, it's change is slow for certain things, especially once it becomes really established infrastructure. So it's, it's kind of a happen. circular problem. It's like you have a core and newcomers, it's hard for newcomers to break in, but that's almost by design because you're right. It mm -hmm. is such a, a crucial piece. So like there has to be, something has to give, like there has to be some kind of break in the, in the core or some kind of path to, yeah, get, get people in. And I think it's, it's funny, like a lot of, of communities I've seen have a really hard time, not only marketing themselves as, you know, Hey, come use our stuff, but also come contribute to our stuff. And it's kind of like a different skill set to, to almost like promote or market if you will, your project to this pool of potential contributors. So it's like a different, it's like, it has to be a shift and it's hard to prioritize that when there's all, you know, so many other things that need to be done and have, you know, are, are uh, driving attention and yeah. And there's often competing products out there, right? So, I mean, if you take like a web server or something like that, would you rather, you know, join an, an early project where you can get in there and you can write code and develop things and stuff like that de novo or do you want to go into an established project where change is really hard because you have to make all these changes and not break anything and not make people angry who use the existing software? Like maintenance coding is an armpit and nobody likes it. And but it's super critical. And it's just it's very hard to incentivize that. This is a nice conversation. So if um so if we were to move forward just as an example here if we were to take a look at this row right here this is clearly something that has come up before and dana listening to you talk this is something that resonates with you so if this is elizabeth on too like if if we were to to follow this row out a little bit further and say how do we help people in better understanding um, recruitment of people with required expertise. Like one of the options that we would have is to develop a metric model that kind of helps answer this particular question. Um, another option would be to do something kind of like what we have with our DEI.MD file. So this is a file that doesn't necessarily track things, but it, it's more of a document that gets people to reflect on how they're thinking about, say, for example, issues and PRs and organizational diversity. You know, we can kind of go the software route, which is saying we're going to try to build a model and build a piece of software that would show metrics related to your ability to recruit people at this 
required expertise level. You know what I mean? So it's the, the metrics, the metrics models in the software that would show this kind of this kind of impact. Or it's a document that really says you can measure it however you'd like to measure, but these are the things that we think you should be considering <laughs> when you're thinking about required expertise level and how you measure it like down in the in the real details, you know, like with what particular software, however it is that you do it, it's kind of up to you. Do you have thoughts on on these paths forward or a couple different ways we could take it? If you wanted to actually measure stuff, I mean, there's, there's the naive statistics where you just get stuff from GitHub. But I mean, if you tied that with, I, I don't know if like diff files and stuff can um, be run through code complexity scanners, right? That might give you some clues about what people are contributing, right? Or if people are contributing one-liners, then that's, that's not big, but if they're contributing much larger, broader changes, then that that's that that should be identifiable through some sort of like code complexity metrics. Um, but you can't just use lines because there's lots of like if somebody goes through and just changes like all the f suffixes from uppercase to lowercase, or you know does a white space change or something like that, it's going to look huge, but it's not really a real complex contribution. But with code complexity, right? Like you could look at that, maybe coupled with you know knowing which modules are more complicated. There might be ways of scoring that metric to where you could kind of track that over time and see how that went. In terms of like you know what can you do to actually get people in? The it, it's like you know chemistry. You're trying to like push people over an activation barrier, and it's like you have to lower the barrier or you have to push the people up, right? Like people have to be either incentivized to participate right and that that's a bigger thing than what you can address here right like that's an industry-wide thing but in terms of lowering that barrier really it comes down to like you know what sorts of intro guides are there it's like you know if you look at the linux kernel they've got some stuff in there where you know if you just want to get started with the linux kernel and, and maybe this is different now this is true like five years ago but there were there are very clear guides about how to get started how to build the kernel how to do all this other stuff and if you want a beginner project, like, you know, here's some stuff, right? They had all these drivers and they wanted people to convert them to their fancy new kernel form and do some other kind of things and stuff like that. And so you could pick one of these, you know, unloved children and then like, you know, fix it up and stick it in there. And, and that was a way to kind of get in and get into practice with their development style and things like that. And I think that that's really the thing that you need is you need to have contributor guides, you need to have like, here's the super easy way to build our software and you need internal documentation, which is something that many software projects just do not have, especially once they grow to a certain size. Like if it's a big complicated thing where you can't just kind of trivially determine the, like if you have a database or something like that, like where you've got lots of moving parts, like, you know, what is the, you know, how does all that stuff work? And, and a lot of stuff is like, you, you go look at it and it's comment free. Right. Or just especially scientific software, it's a bunch of math. And so, like, you know, it's very difficult to, to contribute to stuff like that. And you need to have, especially for scientific software, you need links to papers, like what is this doing? You know, with some sort of discussion about how the code relates to the theoretical paper. Because I feel I feel like there's often in my background, I'm an analytical chemist, not an actual software engineer, but there's often a disconnect between um, you know, what you see in a paper. And what you see like in the software, right? Like if you go look at like the like the SIF or lib AC paper, right, from back in like 2010, it's uh you know, there's a big theoretical paper about doing encryption on the sphere and all this other stuff. And you look at the code and it's just a bunch of uncommented math. And so that that there's that disconnect that that stops people from contributing to that software. And you want to lower those barriers. And I think that's the most critical thing to getting people in there. Especially with scientific software, where it's going to be more challenging. I'm curious what Don or Elizabeth thinks. So I'm Elizabeth, do you see where I'm going with this? Like there's there are kind of listening to Dana talk, like there are specific things that we could in this example measure with respect to understanding your ability to recruit people. There are also things that we could 
ask people to reflect on that may assist them in recruiting people. And so like the, the DEI.md file is really kind of the ladder. We don't talk about how to necessarily measure inclusive leadership, for example. So Dana, this will be a, it's mm. a little bit out of context here, but we kind of say, if you reflect on these four things, you should improve the diversity, equity, and inclusion in your project. That's our hope. Like mm. in, these metrics help you kind of do that. What the numbers are going to look like, we don't particularly talk about that in this document. So one is kind of a reflection approach, and and another is kind of this direct metric approach. And I'm curious what what you think about this. Yeah, I mean one of the one of the things that I'm trying to do with the insight guides is um, to get people to look at some of the data and reflect on why it might be the case, and and some of the um, so if you're not getting enough contributors, for example, um, there will be in those insight guides recommendations that are things like, you know, does your contributing guide actually accurately reflect what people actually need to know in order to contribute? Um, in particular, the contributing guides is something we hammer on a lot with the CNCF projects because a lot of them are, are the, yeah, the contributing guides for a lot of these projects are frankly worthless. These are cloud native projects. It's all the stuff you need to do to get your development environment up and running so that you can even contribute to some of these projects. And they don't put any of that in the contributing guide. It's just like, they should just magically know how that works. Um, yeah. And it makes it really hard to, to contribute to, to these projects. So I think, you know, a lot of this is you, you, you know, you have the data and it gives you indicators of what might be happening, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what you need to fix in order to, um, to improve that thing. And so that I think is what, what the insight guides will, will help with. Yeah, I agree. I, I was just going to say like, you can measure things all day long, but I think it seems like in Dana's case, there's a real desire for change. And so if there's no, um, like if, there, if we aren't changing any levers, then the data won't help that much. I mean, it, you know what I mean? So like the, the change is what's going to be an important here. And then the measuring is the, the thing that will confirm that what you're doing is actually working. So I think that measuring is important, but I think it's the levers and the knowing what to, which, you know, what behaviors to shift and what documentation to add and what um, community culture changes need to be made like things like that I think are are incredibly important so it, to Don to your point as long as it as long as it's somewhere whether it be in the insight guides or in a doc that's publicly maybe both like maybe there should be a, a doc that's publicly posted that kind of outlines this is how we this is how our project publicly approaches these things whether it be you know here's our contributor like it just makes it really clear for the community so maybe it's both of those things that are needed I think I'm I'm learning something. I learned something about the insight guides. <laughs> Let me think about it this way. Um, the, the insight guides are sh showing numbers. They're showing actual metrics like this. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, and stemming from those metrics, they are asking people to reflect on them <laughs> around specific things that they might be able to do. Is that fair so i think the insight yeah absolutely really so cool. so the insight i just put a link to the, the this is a early draft on the responsiveness and frankly no one has looked at this but me so it's not it's not done um okay. yeah but if you look you know there's the identify trends section below which has the graphs so so here's what some graphs look like yeah. and then if you go if you go down further it has details about um you know di yes. diagnose diagnosing the issues and then you know it has gathering gathering more data and then there's a section about making improvements so the making improvements section is not about metrics but it's about things to do in your in your project okay. and some of the things to to watch out for so a lot of people try to improve responsiveness by just like putting their thumbs on the maintainers and if the maintainers are overworked and burnt out, that's just going to make everything worse. It's not going to, it's not going to help. Um, but it talks about, you know, having contributor ladders. It talks about promoting people into reviewer and leadership roles. So it talks about the, like the, what might be core causes for some of these things. Um, 
and how you might go about making those improvements. So these, these aren't the make improvements section isn't about metrics at all. It's really about what are the things you could do differently in your project to, um, to make this better. And then, and then you go back and you continue to measure responsiveness. So you change a couple of things, then you continue to measure responsiveness and did, you know, did the changes that you make actually improve the responsiveness over, over time. And when you're talking about responsiveness, you have to look over kind of a long period of time because sometimes it can take a, it can take a while for the improvements to really, really catch on and stick. And so that's, I kind of talked about all of that in this make improvement section. Okay. Um, okay, this is super interesting. And you, you've probably been, <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm only catching on to these insight guides right now. <laughs> you've probably been talking about like exactly this forever, but I'm, I'm, I'm I, it's starting to click for me as to what they can provide. Um, and so, from my perspective, and totally tell me if I'm if I'm wrong. Um, it, it might be more sensible here to be like insight guides. So here's a particular insight guide that could help you. So as if we, I'm sorry, as we move through this list, we we may find that there are particular areas that are recurring questions for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And if we could work with one group or kind of like Dana, whatever you're doing, you know what I mean? With the communities that you're working with, develop an insight guide that's kind of built from that case, that would be what's provided to people here. Yeah, and the, the insight guides are around they're around particular types of, of, so they're not really a case study. So I would say a case study would be something completely different, but okay. these are really designed to be around a problem that um, communities face. So responsiveness is one, um, bus factor is another, like contributor diversity. Uh, there'll be another insight guide around that one, for example. Okay. And so these, these the insight guides tend to be around problems. I would also really like to have some case studies, which I think are kind of a different thing, which is how have you solved this problem in your in your community? <clears throat> and what can you tell us about your experiences in doing that? And I think I think both are really are really important. Um, the insight guides tell people how to interpret what they're seeing in the metrics and how to what the root causes might be and how to maybe fix them. Um, but a case study would be like, uh, you know, just like a real world example. So, so the insight guides are a little, um, they're very interpretive because it depends on what you're seeing in the community and what else is going on. Um, but the, the case studies are, would be very like detailed. This, this is what we did. This is the impact that it had. This is, this is our experience. Okay. And I think we need both. So we're out, we're out of time and you've given this is there's a lot to think about here. Um well so like I'm trying I'm I'm maybe still struggling then with if we're trying to help answer this question because this is a question that a lot of people have as an example. Mm -hmm. Like what is it that we provide to not just Dana, but to everybody else that may have this question, what's the most tractable thing that we can provide to help? And is it a, a software dashboard? <laughs> you know, is it a set of insight guides? Is it, is it a case study? Is it just a list of metrics? Like, that's what I'm, like, what is it? I'm not sure. I think ideally it's all of those, which I don't know. If that's a that's a great answer. Um, <laughs> but but <laughs> it's, it's metrics. That's how you kind of diagnose the thing, and then it's the insight guides, which is, um, you know, giving people more, more details about how they might resolve this particular issue that they're having, and then the the case studies would be like real world examples of, of people doing that, and they're probably, um. 
So I'm kind of building the insight guides around starting with some of the metrics models. So the responsiveness is kind of the first step. So that's, okay. you know, half of the starter project health metrics model. And then I'll do bus factor and releases as two okay. additional insight guides. And then we can package them together into one like starter project health metrics model insight guides. So, yeah. so the way I kind of picture this, like we can have the individual guides so that if people just want to learn about responsiveness, bus factor, whatever it is, they can dive into those. And then we could package them together because it's it's ultimately it's just web content, right? So we can say for the starter project health, you know, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Um, but we could also spin that for sci you know, scientific software for universities, for OSPOs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, here are the insight guides that might be most relevant for, for you. And so we could we could also do some package some of them up around some of the goals that, that you've been working on. Okay. So could it be, would it be around the goals or the questions, do you think? Oh, uh, the questions, I think. Okay. Sorry. So, I sort of think about these questions as yeah, like yeah. This kind of broader feeding into yeah, the goal. Yeah. Well, that's fair. Yeah. They're just making sure I get it like in the right spot <laughs> in the table. So it would be that here are the and we can sort this out, but like here are the particular metrics and metrics models that you might want to take a look at with respect to this question. Here's a corresponding insight guide as to how you might think about these metrics and metrics models. Mm -hmm. And then given time, a case study about how an organization necessarily implements these and how mm -hmm. it went or didn't go. Is that fair? I, mm -hmm. I think so. I think Dana, uh, does this resonate with you? Like, does this seem like a reasonable approach? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, basically, you just want to know, you know, what kind of data can I collect, and how do I interpret it, and then what do I do to change that data? I mean, I think the only danger is that, like, you get, these are complex people problems. They're more difficult to measure quantitatively, and I think that a lot of software engineers are not always the best at people problem stuff, so um, it's, it's, it's difficult to to communicate these things, but I think the, the guides will help a lot that people, you know, can, can read stuff and, and, and see. And that, that to be fair is the hardest part about writing these guides is that, yeah. um, they're, they're complex people problems. They're not, mm -hmm. they're not measure this thing, do, you know, change X and, and Y changes. It's not, it's not that easy, sadly. Okay. We are at the end of time. Uh, this is a really interesting conversation. I, it's great when I'm, smarter at the end of any meeting than I am before I start. So thank you for the, the, the conversation. I really appreciate it. And I'll talk more about the insight guides in the OSPO working group later today. Um, okay. I'll put that on the agenda. It's really helping like how I can kind of see these things working together to, to help folks. So um, very helpful. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Bye. Thanks. Okay, take care. Bye.